distinguished future musicians, welcome to Stump on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, I'm going to be covering incidence, prevalence, and case fatality rate. This is the fifth video in my biostat section, so I suggest you check out all the rest of them if you haven't already done so. In normal everyday life, incidence and prevalence are used interchangeably. And it's basically because they both, broadly speaking, measure the frequency of something happening. And they're both directly proportional most of the time. When one goes up, the other goes up, and vice versa. So that's why they're confused frequently. However, there's some key differences between the two. And for whatever reason, the test writers love to write questions about those differences between the two. So you got to make sure you know those. You can see here that I give prevalence a high yield rating of eight. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's a rough estimate on a scale from one to 10 of how important each topic is for step one. If you wanna learn more about that, you can go to my website to check out that. Anyway, uh, prevalence is the number of total existing cases divided by the total population. Another way to think about that would be the proportion of the population that has whatever disease you're talking about. For my hometown of Boca, the prevalence of chickenpox would be the people in Boca Raton who have chickenpox right now divided by the total population of Boca. Now, the incidence is the number of new cases within a certain time period divided by the total number of susceptible individuals in the population. You can see that the key difference between prevalence and incidence is incidence is new cases over whatever time period you're looking at, usually a year, while prevalence is total cases, so everybody who has the disease at whatever point in time you're measuring. For incidence, you also are only supposed to include susceptible individuals in the denominator. This usually isn't a big factor because a lot of diseases and things were all sort of susceptible to it, or that difference between the total population and the susceptible population is so small that it doesn't really mess up your calculations. But technically, you're only supposed to count people who can get whatever disease you're talking about. The definition of that will change depending on whatever disease you're talking about. For example, if you're talking about some sort of disease that has an effective vaccine, anybody who's been vaccinated would not be susceptible, so you would remove them from the equation. Annual incidence of chickenpox in Boca, that'll be the number of new chickenpox diagnoses made within the last year, divided by the total population of Boca minus those who have either had chickenpox before or had the vaccine. Because in theory, you should only be able to get chickenpox once and... If you have the vaccine, you shouldn't be getting it at all. So those are those people who aren't susceptible that you're trying to remove from the equation. Incidence is used for most of the different study designs you're going to have to study for uh, step one. So randomized control trials, cohort, case control. And for the most part, incidence is used for most of these because it has a higher validity when you're trying to associate two things. So if you're trying to show that your new drug leads to better health outcomes. You really do need to measure people over time. Prevalence, on the other hand, is pretty much just used in cross-sectional studies. And if you're trying to find an association or a causal link between two things, prevalence or cross-sectional studies have much lower validity because you're not measuring people over time. So say you're trying to link some sort of risk factor like smoking to a disease. You can't really do that with prevalence because all you can find out is you can say, hey, right now, this number of people in the population smoke and this number of people have the disease. You can't really say that one causes the other because you haven't tracked things over time. You haven't figured out what that relationship is. That doesn't necessarily mean prevalence is useless. Prevalence can be still be very useful for certain things like, you know, most governmental statistics on health just rate our overall health system that would be prevalence and those are useful because you're not trying to associate two things necessarily you're just getting a broad picture of what's going on overall also sometimes doing some sort of study looking at prevalence would be cheaper faster and easier than one of the studies with higher validity so maybe you quick look at some of the stats for prevalence of whatever disease or risk factor you're interested in. And if you see certain trends that suggest something's important, 
then you can invest more in a study design, which is more valid. So it's sort of like a starting point sometimes. One of the main things test writers like to ask about incidents and prevalence is how the two are related and how they change in relationship to each other in different situations. In most cases, prevalence and incidence are going to be directly proportional. So when one goes up, the other goes up and vice versa. That intuitive because if you think about more people being diagnosed with diabetes, for example, over the last year, that's obviously going to mean there's a higher number of total people with diabetes. However, this direct relationship is not always there. And test writers actually like to write more questions about when they're not directly proportional. So most of the cases where they're not, you know, heading in the same direction is when there's a change in the duration of the disease. So the duration of the disease is just the amount of time from when you're diagnosed with the disease or have some sort of clinical onset to when you're either cured or die. So it's the amount of time you have the disease. When duration is held constant, then prevalence and incidence are directly proportional. Times when they're not directly proportional is when duration changes. Here's one way to think about this relationship. Now, it's written up as a formula, but this isn't a real formula that you'd actually plug numbers into, so don't think of it like that. This is more just a conceptual thing. So prevalence is equal to incidence times duration. And this relationship makes sense if you think of extreme examples. Consider there's a disease where 100 people are diagnosed each year, but the disease only lasts one day. In that case, annual incidence would be much higher than prevalence because annual incidence would be 100, but at any one point in time, you're only going to have at most one person with the disease. So whenever you do that point prevalence measurement, you're going to have like one. So you're comparing an incidence of 100 to a prevalence of one because the duration is so short. Similarly, you can think of the opposite way. So say there's 100 new cases of a disease and the disease is like a lifelong thing. It lasts for 40 years. In that case, prevalence is going to be way higher than annual incidence because annual incidence is going to be 100, but prevalence is going to have those 100 new cases from that year diagnosed plus cases that have built up over the last 40 years. That shows you how big shifts in duration will change that relationship between the two. Another concept to help solidify this relationship is the sink metaphor. Think of the faucet, the water coming out of the faucet, being incidents. Those are the new cases. And then the, the level of water building up in the sink, that's like prevalence, the total number of cases. And then the drain of the sink would be the number of people who are either cured or dying. So they're leaving that disease population. If patients are being cured really quickly, then the level of the sink won't be very high because the drain is pretty big and it's functioning. However, if really nobody's being cured and there's a long duration, that's sort of like the drain getting clogged up and the sink backing up. So the sink, the, the level of water in the sink will build up. Understanding this will probably be easier with a couple example scenarios. Now I should mention these are kind of oversimplified cases. In real life, these things would be more interconnected and a little bit more complicated, but for our purposes, this will work fine. For this first case, imagine that a county successfully implements a hand-washing campaign. So a lot more people are washing hands, and you're lowering the new number of new cases of the flu. So how does the prevalence, incidence, and duration of the flu change in relationship to this new program? So you're going to have incidents go down. That's the biggest thing because the new cases is going down. But you're also going to have prevalence go down as a result of this program because you have less new cases. You're going to have less total cases because the duration in theory is the same. Now consider there's a new viral strain of the flu that's more infectious than previous strains and it spreads faster. So how does that affect the three measures? Well, then you're going to have more new cases. So your incidence is going to go up. Your prevalence is also going to go up as a result because the duration is the same. Now imagine that a new treatment comes out and it helps people with the flu recover faster. What's going to happen? Your duration is going to go down. So even though the number of new cases is the same, prevalence goes down. You could also think of a new strain of the flu that lasts for two weeks instead of the normal one. How does that change things? So duration is going to go up. Incidence is going to be the same and prevalence is going to go up also. Say the previous season, 
people usually had the flu for about a week and now people are dying in a few days. How does that change things? That's the same thing as if you have a new treatment that works really well. For these calculations, whether people are dying or they're getting cured, it doesn't really matter that much difference as far as, you know, plugging numbers into the formula because the person doesn't have the disease anymore. So I'm also going to throw in case fatality rate here. It doesn't really fit with this section, but I couldn't really fit it into any of these videos, so I just figured I'd tack it onto this one. As the name implies, case fatality rate compares the total number of cases to the number of fatalities from whatever case you're studying, so from that disease. So it's the proportion of the people with a particular disease that die as a result of that disease. So say you're looking at a particular kind of cancer and there's been 20 cases of it at the hospital or whatever you're studying it, and five of them passed away from it. So the case fatality rate would be five over 20. Pretty simple. Here are a list of somewhat related items that I don't even cover in my videos because I think they're so low yield. I would suggest only looking at these topics after you've mastered all of the higher yield material.